you're welcome uh, Dr. Sean McGuire this evening. Um, I've always found myself thinking of the UN for which uh, Sean works as a, as a, a, in the FAO, um, a, part, a part of the UN, um, as a sort of something I take for granted. It's almost like um, uh, a sort of a, a natural <coughs> phenomenon almost, a sort of Mount Everest, something that's always been there, always will be there. Um, and of course, I sort of talking to Sean and in preparing for this uh, this evening, one is reminded that no, it's not. One, it's very new as an organisation. I think 1945 is not a very long time ago. It's a human phenomenon. It's therefore fragile. It's therefore um, fallible. Um, and um, you know, sometimes when I think about the goals of the ideas of trying to feed the world, you know, they seem like uh, sort of naive, almost um, crazy uh, goals to have. Um, and that's why I think it's fascinating to have someone like Sean here to talk to us, to, to have a real insight into how do you actually deliver on a goal like that? What does it look like on the ground to try and turn Quest for world peace, the desire to have every child in the world educated. What does that actually look like on the ground? How do you turn, um, you know, all these lofty uh, ambitions into a target that you can actually deliver? Um, and um, for our uh, students here today, I think it's a fascinating look at this um, journey from theory, science based in the lab, which is all wonderful and, and you know, um, it's some amazing discoveries that are made all the time, but then how do you actually go and use that um, to change lives? Um, so I think Sean um, is, is going to be a wonderful um, glimpse into that process, um, a very useful and interesting insight into the gap um, sometimes between <laughs> Thank you very much, Matthew, and thanks for coming out this evening. Um, I do want to say that, first, I have a question for you, I guess. Who, I was told many of you take theory of knowledge, all of you, great, because this is, in fact, what I've spun, and you may thank me for it, or you may not afterwards, is a theory of knowledge type lecture, so hopefully you get credit and you can sit out the next session. Uh, it, it, this, because I wanted to talk about that, Matthew, raise points about delivery and so on. That's actually not really what I'm talking about today, though. By all means, at the end, we have time for questions. And I want to aim to do this in, I hope, half an hour. So we have lots of time for questions. Then you may well have questions about that, and that's absolutely fine. So this is more in a, you'd say that, aiming for a higher plane, so hence the title, Politics of Hunger, can it undermine science? explain what I mean by that, not, in this case, really, what I want to talk about is the legitimacy or the trust that's placed in knowledge institutions, and sort of what role do they play in tackling these big challenges, and, and what are some of the, the challenges that these institutions face when we don't all think about things the exact same way. They're different, as you guys know, I'm sure, from knowledge theory of knowledge, that there are different ways of understanding the world, there are different political beliefs or priorities, as one may argue, are more polarized now in some ways than they have been for a long time. How does that come to bear on scientific institutions? So that's sort of the theme I want to kind of try to talk about today. It's not some, it refers to power, but it isn't really about power per se. Not without, there we go. Give a little bit of outline here. I'll explain who I am, and I will give the background, the context of food insecurity, and the kind of set of mission that organisations like FAO have to do, and, and explain in a couple of slides very briefly FAO's role in that. Though there's you know, the tip of the iceberg there, but again, we can come back to follow up on questions, and then get to the main theme, which is about experts 
say, where is expert knowledge? What's the place of that in dealing with complex questions? And what do we mean by legitimacy of experts? So I put you on this, people on the spot later on and say, well, what do we think is a legitimate expert or an illegitimate expert? Does that have any meaning? And I'll give some examples on seeds and biodiversity and then highlight the, the kind of challenge. So who am I? Well, I'm a Canadian by birth, though I lived in Britain. 15 years. I came to Rome only two years ago. My background academically is quite mixed. I started in science and biology. I did an IB, I won't tell you how many years ago, but I did theory of knowledge. And I always wanted to work in international development, so I did a first degree in biology with the intention of moving into social science and then moving toward more social science in agriculture and then something closer to anthropology for my PhD, but looking at farmers' knowledge and plant breeders and plant science and the relationships between those. So it's been a very mixed training and it uh, puts it an interesting position in reflecting on okay, where the strengths and weaknesses of science as we understand that and where the, uh, how, you know, how do we work across disciplines to try to address Yes, it's sounding like a university lectures because I was for 15 years until I came to FAO to Rome. I, I taught in a place called University of East Anglia, which is a university in the east of England, uh, on a school of international development. So I taught undergraduate and master's students in international development, environmental management, agriculture, even a little bit of policies, things like globalization, food, and so forth. So it's quite a wide ranging program one of the only scientists in the department. There's a data on sort of half a scientist. A research I've worked in about 15 different countries, mostly Africa, but a bit of Asia and, and the Caribbean, on something called food systems. And I'll mention that later on as an example, but we won't get into depth unless you really want to, because trust me, if you get me started on seed systems, I won't stop. So try to keep it on other things. But also natural resource management and on scientific biotechnology institutions and training in Africa. <laughs> and since 2016, for two years, a bit of an impact on sea security. Now, to the context here, what we're talking about, and I, I'm going to go over this very quickly because I know everyone knows this, or should know this, and you wrong, that you know, we're still, despite huge progress in terms of dealing with hunger and, and agricultural development, improved crops, improved practices, improved production systems. There have been far fewer famines now than there have been any time in human history. But still, there are over 800 million people who are undernourished in the world. And as you see here, the circle there, it's kind of going up. So it's leveled off, it's dropped down from something close to 14% of the world's population. It's leveled off at almost 11%. Does anyone know what the Sustainable Development Goal target is for 2030? For what proportion of people should be hungry? Anyone want to guess? Zero. It's zero. It is the, so you know, that's what we're dealing with here. Is the, the, the world has, and you should, all, everyone should know this, the Sustainable Development Goals, and I'll come to that in a second goals that have been agreed a few years ago for 2030. One of the key ones, number two, is zero hunger. The clue's in the name. <laughs> so that's where we're going with that. As you see, there's some distance to travel. The, additionally, you say, well, I think going the wrong way. The, some of the challenges of facing that, I mean, the conflict and insecurity are significant. Yemen, South Sudan, Syria, these are countries that have Northeast Nigeria, these are countries, all of which where conflict is one of the major drivers, where have some of the most severe food insecurity at the moment. So, uh, and Somalia. So those are the, the, the ones that are the most severe now. So those are factors that you could say science can only 
to help around the edges, we can't solve those issues. Those are fundamentally ones of geopolitics. But there are other ones, such as extreme climate-related disasters. And I did highlight this example here, that circle so well. You see that circle there? The level of extreme climate events increasing. Particularly the one I circled there is drought. So over the last, you know, you probably have a hard time reading that as I do. But that's starting at about 1995, 1990, moving through 2015 then. So you can see the sorts of trends. Depressing, but perhaps not that surprising. Another is that if we look here at the proportion of, of, of these are developing countries, proportion of people that are extreme are facing severe malnourishment or undernourishment, it's much higher in this case, it's 15 percent almost. 17.5%, a much larger, absolute number, almost 600 million, in countries that are facing a lot more ex high level of exposure to vulnerable, to variable weather, so to climate related disasters. Again, none of this should be that surprising, it's just depressing, but it gives a sense of the scale of the challenges that are among many drivers of food insecurity. Now, where does science fit in? And I put this slide up here, it's just one snapshot. There are many others we could do in saying, well, where are ways moving forward? One is that sustainable intensification, there are many technical areas that could address, could play a role in addressing food security, perhaps not in solving wars, but in things like sustainable intensification. So producing more food, Increasing amounts of land, using resources more efficiently. It's a great, a, a great ambition. It's quite a technical challenge. But as you see here, this gives some indication. You can spot the these are the areas of farmland. Just circling a few examples that focus on maize. And where you see the darker colors, the red, those are showing areas that are very far from the peak yields possible for that particular. So it's singling out there and saying there's where the red that's there's a lot of room for improved production. So just those crops. Now that's you know, we could have lots of arguments of what's the right way of doing this, should we focus only on maize and that, but it's saying that there's there's a lot of room for growth. And again, this is an area for where science has a pretty significant role. <laughs> other things we talk about shifts to more sustainable <laughs> diets, reduce food waste, there are many other things. Managing natural resources more sustainably, these are all part of the kind of nuts and bolts of addressing food insecurity and indeed are very central to what organizations like FAO do. So, so I'll give you two slides on FAO and then we'll get into the discussion of experts. So FAO is, you know, call it here in, you know, it really is a knowledge network. I'm not just saying that because this is a theory of knowledge themed talk, but it's also, this is what's on FAO's homepage, that it is a center of information, not just to the people that are in the building, people like me, but ones that are linked in many different ways to the networks that an organization like FAO spends. And so it's a specialized agency, with special training in agriculture, forestry, fisheries, statistics, economics, and so forth. But the mandate of all of these specialists is to combat hunger and malnutrition. It has 194 member countries, so virtually all the countries in the world. I can't think of many countries or territories that are not members of FAO. It is one that has the, you know, the widest participation, one of the widest participation of any UN agency. And you'd say one of the things it does is it helps facilitate access to expert knowledge. So it produces global public goods. We produce global public goods by collating information, by assessing it, making it publicly available, disseminating statistics, and more importantly then analyzing and disseminating technical guidance, best practices, policy advice. These are things that are meant to go directly back to serve the activities of these 194 member countries their request in many cases. And you can imagine there's a lot of back and forth with member countries of what 
they would like FAO to work on and how then the strategic plans get developed. It's not just something where people sort of down the road decide, here's what we're going to prioritize. We respond to member countries. But in so doing, by bringing forward this knowledge and information, FAO also implements projects in many, many countries. I involve myself in about 40 of them in one way or another. And policy support in these member countries, again, at the country's request. And then finally, FAO is a neutral space, and this is important when we come back to talking about experts and this issue of trust and legitimacy, is that FAO is, convenes meetings, brings together stakeholders, and this is the point of the knowledge network, who are themselves experts, not necessarily just technical experts, but people who represent a trade body or represent indigenous peoples of a particular region of the world. So they're coming in with their own particular agenda and knowledge, but they represent a legitimate voice, or consumers, or academia, and of course scientific experts and technical experts in many, many disciplines. So it brings these stakeholders together, not just to devise advice, but often to come to agreements about standards or guidelines and so forth. It's a very slow process, as you can imagine. It always is, if you need 100% consensus, but this is how these rules get made. You can't make these rules in any other way that people would accept. To say, oh, we have five countries set up a rule for a standard for pesticides. What are the other 191, 190 countries going to do? They won't accept it, either, you know, understandably. So this is part of the, the nuts and bolts of FAO. And finally, you know, we work like other UN agencies and many other agencies on the sustainable so there we are, we've got zero hunger. Of, uh, there are 17 of them. FAO works on most of them. And this slide here puts them up roughly in proportion of their centrality to what FAO does. So zero hunger is the big one for us, but also life below water and life on land. So management of fisheries, and aquatic management more broadly, and poverty. So there's quite a few of these goals. FAO itself is what we call a custodian of indicators. So, as I said, we've got targets for all of these, and there are, I don't know off the top of my head, how many targets there are for the Sustainable Development Goals. I think it's in the order of two or three hundred. So all of these 17 areas will then be broken down into sub-areas, and then we'll have indicators and targets. So it's not just to say, hey, we promise to eliminate poverty. Well, how are we going to measure? world is committed to saying we want to have a certain proportion of land under productive and sustainable agriculture. So look at the sustainability and productivity together. Well, that's great. How do you measure that? You know, and how are we going to, and those are things that then we spend time devising these indicators and trying to set those up. Again, ways that every country finds acceptable and all the interest groups do. And FAO alone is a custodian of about 50 of these indicators. So people down the road are responsible and will be held accountable for gathering the numbers and analyzing them for 2030. Okay, this is all by way of background. This is really what I want to kind of talk about, and this gets a bit more, as I said, conceptual, but it really gets to the heart of the issues of experts and legitimacy. Now, I really want to talk about that, not in specifically reference to FAO, but more to talk about my own experience outside and before I worked in FAO. And the issues I'm raising here are relevant to an organization like FAO, but to many others. And it's more a general thing of saying, okay, well, how do knowledge institutions kind of maintain legitimacy? And why do we need expertise? And the first thing is that, as you can perhaps <laughs> hopefully agree from what I've said before, there's lots of challenges, there's lots of need for specialized knowledge to address them. There are lots of issues that aren't black and white, that need kind of judgment and experience. And that's where expertise, as opposed to just having you know, a scientist or an artificial intelligence a computer system, you say, well, you can make decisions based on stats. Expertise is much more about knowledge and judgment. So it's weighing up different solutions best on, based on experience, best practice, giving 
suggestions to policymakers, looking at trade-offs between various targets and goals. As you can imagine, the world had, you know, we're not just talking about food security here. We start thinking about biodiversity, um, economic development, <laughs> gender, put all these agendas together, and many others. They're all important, and so expertise is needed to, you know, the, the decisions and the goals we're making are becoming ever more complex, like the 200 or 300 indicators we have for the SDGs. So the needs for experts are more than they ever have. And you know, this is something you guys should be thinking about a lot as well. It's not that the world is going to become more straightforward. If anything, we're going to need to be smarter and understand that because we care more about facing lots of challenges, we're also caring about these trade-offs. We can't just maximize the use of forests anymore without concern for biodiversity. That might have been acceptable 50 years ago, if it even was then, but it isn't enough. So, you know, policy is more complex, it's more multifaceted. We need that thing. So when you have expert knowledge that feeds into policy, if it's going to work, it needs to be legitimate. On the spot here and say, well, what do you think? What does legitimate mean in this context? And say, we've got an expert, let's say a think tank, or a, a bit of advice from a specialist. And you say, okay, that's a legitimate candidate. What makes it legitimate? You in front. <laughs> the, the goals and the um... The, the knowledge itself, the body of knowledge, has, has to be accepted widely in that society. The norms that they are um, thinking about. Yeah. Well, that, that's one. I mean, there, there, there's more than one answer. So that's one answer. There. Okay, yeah. They're, they're, they're based on knowledge that other people go, okay, we accept that knowledge. That's not coming out of left field. We think that's valid knowledge. Other things. Well, that might be other things here. It's not a test, though. It's more just kind of get us all onto the same. Yeah. Yeah. Objective, unbiased. Verifiable. Verifiable, yeah. Check it and say, oh, you know, don't take my word for it. Go on the experiment yourself. Here's how you do it. You know, that's the scientific method. Show the show the results and say, well, if you want to repeat the experiment, by all means, here's exactly how I did it. Go check yourself. Other things? Is measured? Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they, they give evidence. They've measured things like saying, okay, that improved, a good example, X makes a difference on cancer. Oh, great. Well, how much? You know, there's lots of things that have, but you know, how strong is that effect? Should I worry about it? Yeah, please. Supposed to be evaluated, for example, whether it's causing or causing cancer, whether it would be helpful implications or positive or positive. Great. Absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. You know, I thought of, yeah, you know, you're, that, that, you know, as you put it, not just any advice, but considered advice. Ones that actually thought, okay, we're not just saying, oh, this works, let's do it. But it makes this spot through, okay, this is, you know, all of these points about it's unbiased, that it's independent, verifiable, measured, based on valid knowledge, all of these things. As you can imagine, every knowledge institution is concerned with maintaining its legitimacy, being said, okay, we want to be seen as trusted. And that it, it's <clears throat> the, this becomes challenging when we're talking about issues where the stakes are really high, where the evidence is the knowledge base is perhaps more multidisciplinary, more uncertain. Some, I'll give some examples in a second, where reasonable people who maybe fall into all of these categories that you've ticked off, unbiased, using evidence and that, may have come to different conclusions about what is the right thing forward. Maybe your point is the one that is the sticking point there to say, well, what are the implications of that? Different people say, I don't think that's a word. Brexit in Britain is a good example. People, some people claim there's no downside to it. We don't believe there's a danger. Others say, well, that's wrong. You know, we don't know until we'll see that happen. So there, these concerns could also be because of the absence of evidence, not because people are being stupid. But I guess my
my point here is that when we start getting into complex issues, it's hard to get consensus that reasonable people may come for various different reasons from a different starting point, even if they're unbiased and they're based on what they consider valid knowledge. It may be different knowledge than other people, or they come with different moral or other 